It is a little bright, so you're getting sunglasses again. You're getting clean sunglasses again. I should get another pair of these dollar store. It's all the sunglasses I've ever bought. All right. Welcome to the personal vlog. Usually I try to update if there's anything going on in my life. It's all staying real similar. Uh, almost done with Man in the High Castle for the show that I'm re watching. So close. We are on the last season. I'm like halfway through it. I have no idea what's going to happen. There, It's been... Am I recording my audio? I am. Good. All over the place. Ah. <sighs> I really, I haven't made much progress in the book, The Hobbit. Um, I forgot. And I moved my tablet away from my bed. And that's how I read at night. I set it up to be on the dimmest possible setting. And the blue light filters and all that. So I can just read and fall asleep. And I'll read not even a page and fall asleep. It's been real tired. Um, but -dum, but -dum, but -dum. Still making my way through Hogwarts Legacy. Fantastic game. Really enjoying it. I think, I, I think I'm about 40 hours in at this point. I may 100% it. I really like doing all the collectibles in there. That's good. Um, besides that, it's kind of it. I took last weekend and did all those things that I just mentioned. Not really reading, but I did all those things. The other things that I mentioned. Um... And that was pretty much how I spent last weekend, which I took off from going outside. It was a lot of fun. I did that. Oh, I'm playing Minecraft again. I got back into doing that. I do that. I've done that, I think, every weekend for a month now. Just a couple hours at the least. Um, last weekend I did it three days in a row. Each each day on the weekend I woke up and I put on a podcast for three or four hours. And I, I played the... I'm playing... Uh, a version of Minecraft that has been modded. It has all the mods, and that's why it's called All the Mods. And I'm really enjoying it because there's just so much. Like, I had, a, I got a jetpack last weekend, so I can fly around the map now, which makes it a lot easier to find things. It's huge, and there's a lot of advancements you can make. So I'm happy to be doing that. I've done that multiple times. I'll start a, a save in a version, whatever the newest one is, with all the different things that they've added in, and just play through until I get bored, basically, or excuse me, overwhelmed, usually, because it gets really detailed and really nitty-gritty into, um, like, I, I want to call it the science, but I don't know if that's entirely accurate, but yeah, there's, there's some things that are, I mean, really scientific. You have to go get these elements of, or these materials to do this stuff, and it's just, it's really, some of it goes over my head with the mechanics of it. It's engineering, really, is what I'm trying to say. There's a lot of, like, I would not be surprised if actual engineers had worked on those mods and people who knew what they were doing with that kind of stuff. And there's even programming in it. You can, which I haven't gotten to. This was years ago. A friend introduced me to it, um, playing modded Minecraft as opposed to the original version, which was all that we had played up until that point. And he was like, you got to check this out. I got a server with my friends. And these are people who went to college and are in college currently and doing that stuff. And like, one of the things he specifically was like, oh, check it out. This is a, I think it was called a turtle, a mining turtle. And it's just like a little box with a pickaxe. And you set it up and tell it, you know, here's, but you program it. You actually do software programming. I do not know what language it is. Now that I actually have a, a, a grasp of programming, I really want to get back to doing that thing again. But it's, it's pretty far down the road of the things that you have to do. But I might, I might make a note for myself to do that. So anyway, playing Minecraft, watching TV, stuff like that. It's fun. It's good times. That's what I do when I'm not doing this stuff. The biggest thing that I have been working on over the last week, just here and there, whenever I get an idea, is I, I've been talking about it for probably two months now, um, is making a series of videos about things that I like, physical objects, for the most part. Because of reasons. 
I'll get into it. I started writing down because I was questioning. I was like, why do I want to do this? To make sure that I really want to put in the time and effort for something like this. So I came up with a bunch of stuff, but I'll get to that. Anyway, the point is, I know it would be better to wait. I've talked about it every time I've said it. I've been like, I just would have more room if we can move into a place that's not so small. Um, I could set up a whole kind of recording studio, uh, you know, or at least a table and be able to do that stuff. I didn't, I've been building it just in my bedroom. I just moved some stuff around and pretty much set up on the, the dresser so that I can, I have a couple cameras there. I'll go into that more when it's time and it may be time this weekend. I almost have everything I need for that, I think. And I started researching topics for, um, the first couple videos I want to make about a couple specific objects that I was like, oh, I like this, I like this, I like this. I mean, I could almost do anything, but there are a few, and I'm not just going to, you know, randomly pick and go, here it is, now let's make a video about it. I'm only going to do ones that I really feel, you know, a connection with somehow, or something that I really like, or something that I think I can talk about um, and do some research on. So I started doing that. So we're real close on doing that. It may be a Monday project. I might work on that on Monday. Depends on how long editing all this takes, really. Um... So we'll see. But the personal side of things, questions and answers, I looked through and found one today, which was, what is a goal you set out to achieve and accomplished? Now, I'm very goal-oriented, and a lot of this stuff that I'm doing I could talk about for a long time, but I want to pick one that I have accomplished. So I thought back, and I went, oh, well, I think the first one that I really set out that I'm the proudest of over the course of my life was um, a little bit of backstory. When I was a child, we were all homeschooled, and we had an after school. We started doing after school activities at some point, and one of my older sisters started taking dance dance lessons at a ballet studio. They taught a lot of different styles, but I spent a lot of time bored in the lobby playing with the other kids who, or like the, the other brothers who, as it, it was a mostly female dominated activity. And so there would be their siblings sitting there. So I played with that and like did that, but I wanted to do something myself because surprise going to the studio multiple days a week for a pretty much, you know, mid afternoon until evening, we would do that. That would kind of be the schedule. And then they would have recitals, which meant that we would go to a location, you know, theater of some kind or somewhere where they were a performance hall. Then they would put on, you know, a performance twice a year. I think they did a spring and then a winter and the winter was always Nutcracker. So I've heard the Nutcracker music more times than I can count. But hey, I really enjoyed to learn. I, I really, that, that could spin off on a whole other topic where I talk about my entire theater background because I wound up going into theater, not quite as a career, but kind of as a career because I did get paid for it professionally, but, you know, doing, doing theater work. But that, before we get to that, that's much later on. In the same, par in the same um, shopping complex as the ballet studio, there was a karate studio. And they were friendly enough with that kind of stuff. They had like a little box, a lot of the, the, you know, the different things you would, if you went to another location within the shopping center, you would see the same box over and over. And it's a box with the Karate Studio logo. It's like win free lessons, put it, you know, you sign your little slip, pull it in. And if they draw you out, you know, you won lessons. Well, I would come to find out later that they just called everyone who dropped that in there because, you know, this is a marketing scheme. It's to get people in the door. Right. But we did. My sister, my younger sister and I put in our, put in our names. We were like, do you think we can do this? Can we put our names? Can we see if we win? And my parents were like, yeah, sure. Go ahead. And so we did and we won and they called us in for three, three lessons. That was their thing. It was three 30 minute, 20, 20, 30 minute lessons with a black belt. Just kind of going over the basics, kind of introduce you again. This is how they got new customers. One of the ways for people who were not specifically interested, but that was, you know, offer, offer free, come in, check it out, see how it was going. Maybe they were even 15 minutes. I don't remember how short they were, but we did. We went in and we kind of learned the basics and was kind of, you know, had never taken anything like that before. And they were like, well, do you want to do that? And I was like, well, they get to do ballet. We're right here doing this kind of stuff as well. Can I start taking karate lessons? And I did. I started that around 10 years old and that became my life for a long time. <laughs> Um, 
eventually after, let's see, I went through, started at the white belt, of course, that's what you do when I was 10, and I started making my way through stuff. I want to say, at a certain point, it changed from just a hobby that we went and did into more of a, I don't know what another, uh, I mean, I guess I was passionate about it, so it would have been a passion at some point. Because I wanted, I, I enjoyed doing that. I was physically active, which I was not in any way. I did not do sports of any kind. Again, homeschooled, so we didn't have any, you know, regular public schooling where they would force you to have a physical activity. We just played in the yard. And sometimes, I, at, at the most, I, I did have friends who lived across the street and we would play basketball or baseball or football, maybe. Touch, but it was just like every once in a while. It was not a, this was a, regularly active interest that we were pursuing. And it wasn't just me, because after I started, uh, the older sibling who was doing ballet was like, well, I'm going to do karate too. Join the karate studio. The younger sibling did as well. Almost everybody in the family at some point did. Most of it. We had a lot of siblings. I have a lot of siblings. There was a lot of uh, children in this family. And most of us wound up taking karate in one shape or another. But... After a year or two, somewhere in there, I don't remember at what point, I, I was like, this is what I want to do. I was there all the time. I was volunteering whatever I could, that kind of stuff. And they had something that they called, oh, it was the SWAT team. Everything was an acronym. I remember that. Everything had to have a name and stuff like that. It was a self-defense martial arts system. Um, so it wasn't Taekwondo or anything like that, um, or which was more flashy and more you know, competitive, those kind of things. It was, it was learning to defend ourselves and that was incredibly useful. I found anyway, the goal that I set out to accomplish, I'm getting off track and trying to go through the entire history of this stuff, but at some point it turned and it was when it turned, uh, where we stopped focusing on just like as an activity and more of setting goals to achieve. And they were real big on that too. Like that was kind of their whole the, the system with that kind of stuff, there was, you know, they, they put it specifically on there and it came to be something I realized much later on as an adult, when I was looking over my diploma for one of the, the built upgrades, I've forgotten what we called it. <laughs> anyway, they, uh, they had something on there that like, they had very, uh, symbols for the school and each little thing meant a different thing. It's about the only thing at one point I was considering getting a tattoo and I went and asked them and it's like two dragons with their tails wrapped around a dagger and then the blade. And so like each dragon stands for something in the blade and there's a number three on it. And the three stands for 3% of people who set a goal actually achieve it. it. There was some study done. I don't remember all the specifics. I would have to go back and try to dig up. I need to find that stuff. Um, I have a feeling I don't have it anymore, and I should. I never wanted to get rid of that, but I think it may have wound up in a box that I left at my dad's house after I was living with him. Anyway, at a certain point, I don't remember when, I want to say it went white, gold, two levels of gold, two levels of white, gold, blue, green, brown. So white, two levels of gold, two levels of blue, two levels of green, six levels of brown. So that's 13, and then the 14th would be a black belt. But at a certain point, you would be able to... I think I was somewhere in the greens. I don't remember if I if I was brown already by that point. I'd have to look, because I, I did this for years. And I the way I was able to tell, I took all my... You, you kept all your old belts, of course. You did that. Now, the traditional style, originally, you would be awarded a white belt when you start, and it would get black as it just goes over the years and you you don't wash it and it just becomes black with age <sighs> sounds kind of gross but anyway that's not how modern you know part of it is teaching you know the ancient history discipline the martial arts everything like that and also it's a business this is america capitalism so you kind of have to be able to go through with that so we would we'd go through and they would have like a a, a ceremony each month where you would take a test to see if you would pass and go to your next belt level. Um, and pretty much for the most part, most people passed. If you get held back one, there would be a reason, but it wasn't very often that that happened because there would also be parents who were upset if their kid got held back and that kind of stuff. That's where the, it becomes more of a business and less of like 
you know, back in the old days, you probably would have been held back until you actually proved yourself. Whereas, you know, again, the parents are paying money. They expect to see something. So there was that kind of stuff. But anyway, the point was somewhere around in there, and I don't remember exactly what belt level, they had this SWAT team that I mentioned. And it was called that because it was, I think it was the special winning attitude team which didn't make any sense why we called it SWAT team, because then it would say team twice, and I'm pretty sure we made jokes about that plenty. But also, that sounds interesting. Anyway, you then could get a red belt. And that would be... You would wear that, except for certain occasions where you were supposed to... Like, you would... you They were okay with you not switching. In theory, how it should have been, you would wear the red belt when you would... Uh, help you were you were assisting that was the whole point you basically were assisting the black belt in different classes and you were learning and things like that but you were you were there to help out the lower ranks than yourself um and they gave you a special color for that and it was solid red and then there there was another level where it was like red with a black stripe running through it was there just two or was there a third one after that i don't remember anyway Somewhere in there, I don't remember if it was green or brown or something like that, but at, at some point they were like, well, you're interested in this. You are young. I was, I would have been 11 or 12 at this point because I've been doing it for a year or two. But they were like, you're clearly dedicated to this stuff and knowledgeable, so we want you to help do this stuff, come out and do that. And so I did that, and the older sister did that as well. And we had another friend or two who joined up. But it, we kind of made up that team of that stuff. So you would wear your red belt when you were assisting, and then in theory you were supposed to change it out to whatever your normal rank was for when you go and take a class. They were more lax on that. I don't think we always changed out that stuff. But you definitely had to be wearing the right one when you went to take your test because it was more... It's kind of a performance as well for the parents who would come and watch and see what you've learned. Anyway, around the time that I did the red belt and joined the SWAT team, that was when we started getting serious about, well are you going to get your black belt? And that was like, I set a goal. That was the whole point of all of this, to set a goal to get the black belt. And the way that it mathed out, I moved through the ranks quickly because they, they said it typically takes on average four years, I think. I think it was like three to four years. And I did it in two and change. I did it in under three years. I don't remember exactly when I started, but I do know I got my black belt Around the time that I turned 13, uh, which would have been summer of 2004. 2004, yes. And I'm pretty sure it was before that. Again, I need to find that diploma. That's what I'm talking about. We got You'd get a diploma every time, and we'd save those, but the one specifically you would get, and it would come framed. I think it came framed, or we bought a frame. It was the most important. Black belt, right? You would get that. And I did. I set out... I didn't... <laughs> I learned a lot from that experience because I almost didn't get it, but I trained a lot. I worked really hard. It was one of the things that, I mean, it was what I wanted. That was all that was that, that was all that my life was at that point. I played video games as well, probably, and like hung out with friends, one friend that I had, but for the most part, we were determined to get our black belt. Uh, my, my friends also at the same time were trying to do that. Um, and I also had siblings and whatnot, who the older one made it to black belt as well. But anyway, that was later on down the road after I'd become a black belt. And after I got my black belt, they were like, great, you're only 13, but let's have you teaching the young, young kids. And so I taught kids for another year or two before the studio closed down. But anyway, the, the goal that I set out to accomplish was to get my black belt. And I did. I did it in under three years, which was faster than the average, as I said. Um, but I almost didn't. <laughs> I, I went in for the test, and this is ridiculous. This is, how long was this test? Four hours of physical non-stop demanding. I mean, they, they work you because it's physically demanding, and that's kind of the point. Again, it's discipline. It's learning. Um, it was knowledge. It's physical. It's that kind of stuff. So it was, it's a non-stop. And they warn you. They tell you all this before, and they're like, you will be allowed to stop and get water when we tell you you're allowed to stop and get water. But this is going to be one of the most physically demanding things you've ever gone through. And it was. And it still remains to be one of the physically most demanding things. I think it was probably four hours because they blocked out. It was, they only did black belt testing closed to the public. Nobody's allowed in. Studios locked down. It's just family members. And you're, you're in a panel full of the black belts. They bring in everybody. 
So there's probably 10 people there watching you. And I took it. They have it for adults and they have it for the children. I was a child at this point, And there was one girl also who was there with me. So it was almost private, but there was one other person. Because I think a private test would have been, the, the nerves would have killed me. So there was one other person there. And it requires, it's, it's, a, it's like a three-part thing. First of all, you have to physically demonstrate everything that you've learned over the last few years. And they will run you through everything. And you have to know it, and you have to know it pretty much perfectly. And then there is a knowledge part of it. They're going to ask you questions about this whole thing, and you have to have these answers memorized for that. And there's a lot of, it's, it's, I wish I could remember any of them. And then there is an essay part of it. You have to write an essay about what it means to be a black belt. I basically failed the essay. Uh, my writing skills were basically non-existent because homeschooled, so we did not have that kind of structured doing stuff like that. I, I would be very interested to talk to the adults who looked at it and were like, you were 13 and probably were writing like an eight year old or something is my assumption. Just based on looking back at that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm, I, I would be very curious to see, but yeah, I, they, I submitted it and the, the owner of the studio called me and was like, do better, do it again. I think you can do better. And I remember we, we had plans like that Friday, it's on a Saturday. And I remember we had plans on the Friday because I wa we had to go up to another city a couple hours away for, I think there was a theater thing for my oldest sibling. I don't remember exactly what the scenario was, but I do remember writing this essay on the car on the way home and like turning it in to people before the test. And it was basically, they would look it over and approve it and I'd get to take the test or they'd say no. And I would have to wait another month or wait however long until they did black belt testing again because it wasn't very often which is why i kind of got bumped up to be able to do it at the same time as this other girl who because otherwise i would have been waiting for the next round of they don't do that that one wasn't every month that was every i don't know maybe basically as often as they needed to they would kind of wait until everybody grouped together and then go all right everybody you're all here we're gonna go ahead and you know you're all getting close to it we'll set it a couple months out and something like that as far as i remember Again, this is now almost 10 years ago. So I almost failed that, and I definitely failed the knowledge part of it. There were things that they specifically asked me, and I could not give the answer, and the girl remembered. I was just, it was a lot of nerves, it was too much to remember, and I couldn't do that. I, it, like, the physical, they said I was fine. The essay, first one wasn't so good, but the second one they read, they're like, all right, I read, I, I remember specifically one of them, because we're also kind of like a family and really close, and I remember one of the adults was like, your second one was much better. I read the first one, yeah. Second one was better. So I don't know what I did differently. I just remember writing it in the car on the way home and stressing out about it a lot and getting it done and being like, well, I guess I did my best here. I don't know what I did differently. The only thing I can imagine from what he taught, like the first one, I don't really remember if I phoned it in. I just, I didn't feel that much. And the second one was like, all right, be as emotional as possible, I guess. <laughs> because I don't know what else, like they just didn't feel the passion in the writing, I guess. I don't I couldn't tell you, but I almost feel that the knowledge part. I definitely did. They, the girl passed. She was fine. She, they were like, yep, you're going to, you're a black belt. Michael, you got two weeks. You're kind of under probation. You did the physical fine. The essay was passable, but the knowledge side is not there. You don't have the answers that you're supposed to. So you, you get like kind of a probationary two week thing to get to do it. And so then, so then I go and I'm studying and I'm trying to memorize every day, constantly just going over these books, trying to remember all these things. Cause they kind of give you all this stuff beforehand. Oh, did my camera just turn off? Sure did. Time to switch to the GoPro. Do, 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 do. Just going to buy time. Cause I got my audio going. I hope. I mean, I still, yeah. If I can hear myself in my ear, my audio should be going. It better be anyway. I'm surprised it overheated this quickly. Oh, it's back. All right, that's weird. No, it's not. It's frozen. <laughs> that camera is not doing well. Just get, oh man, I didn't put a battery in there. Where's my battery? Anyway, I'm buying for time, because I usually don't sit down and try to edit these videos specifically. Um, it's a lot of... Man, I should have put a battery in them before I put this GoPro up here. Yeah, this thing is not... It's not giving me the overheating. 
It's not saying that it's overheating, but it keeps cutting out and on. It's not having a good time. That goes in there. This thing, turn on. And then we put you back into here. And we record through the GoPro. Come on. ideal but that should work what drop we're just gonna turn you off because you're having problems you are pretty hot little pocket camera okay audio is still going so hopefully you stayed through that um the knowledge wasn't there i had to train my mind a lot more than i was training my body um And yeah, I, I was under probation. I basically passed and failed the test at the same time. Um, I wonder... Eh, anyway. And I had to do... I was under probation, which meant, like, she passed right away, and they said that I, had a, I would get a second chance, and if not, then I'd have to do the entire test over again, that entire physical thing. So the next week i don't remember i don't think it was two weeks i think that's too long i think it may have just been like go home over the weekend work on it and then some one day next week we'll talk about it and so whatever day they had the most black belts there they brought me into the office again or into an office instead of into like the the studio where you do that they just pull me into the office and they go all right we got the sheet of things here here are all the questions you got to know everything on here no 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 hiccups no mistakes it's like 20 questions and I went all the way through it. And I, I, at that point, they're like, okay, now you're a black belt. <laughs> Which was, for that specifically, um, the way that they would do it for any other belt, you know, anything not the black belt, right? It would be go in for your test on a Saturday morning or something or Saturday afternoon. They may, they may block them depending on who, you know, they kind of put like... If I remember correctly, I think when they did this once a month, they bring everybody in and they would let the, you know, everybody would go in. So you're into a, a room with like maybe 50 people, you know, you're in the studio, you're all doing that stuff. Everybody spreads out and you go through the forums, you do that stuff. And then they go, all right, white belts first. You know, they get through all the white belt stuff and then the white belts come up and the white belts get to graduate and they would have the belts there. They would have an exchanging. There wasn't a whole ceremony. It was more of just, we've got it on a table. We already have your diploma, assuming that you make it. Otherwise, we printed this for no reason. Again, not many people did not pass the test. But then they would come up, and they'd give you your belt, and you'd shake their hand or something like that. And then the white belts would be excused. And then the gold, you know, the yellow belt would come up. Or they would, you know, then they would continue through all the yellow belt stuff. So if you're if you're there as like a, a green, which I think was the highest level, because then they broke it up into a different test altogether for brown belts, because there were six levels of those. So if you went through that, um, and again, this is just how this one studio did it. As I've become an adult and realized that it was not law, how that kind of stuff went, that was probably specific to that style of martial arts taught by that person at that studio, the whole thing. Anyway, so you would go through that, but that would be the ceremony. The black belt ceremony was very different. That would happen on a different day, the actual belt ceremony. Because uh, that was different from your test. The test, again, close to the public. The belt ceremony was on another, I'm sure it was a Saturday, but everybody could come to that. And so you would, you know, there would be a much larger crowd for that. And that was just something where you would go in, you'd do a little back and forth with the, the belt, black belts, and then you would come up. And there would, that would be more of the traditional, if you've ever seen uh, Karate Kid, that was the belt exchange there where they you kneel. You're on the ground, the black belt's on the ground, you're putting your foreheads to the belt, that whole thing, exchanging, you'd, t you'd swap your belt while kneeling. That was, the, the, that was just for black belts at that point, because that was the more traditional, ancient way of doing it, I guess. I don't remember exactly. But anyway, so that, I passed, the, I passed that, and then I went back, and we were able to do that. And I, I'm guessing that was just a week, because I, I think the reason that they did it that way... Um, 
it was more of a ceremony was a you were much more likely to fail the black belt test and have to do it over again they would actually fail people for that doing that kind of thing and b they needed more time after you passed your test to get your belt they would special order that they just had a storeroom full of all the other belts but black belts were special they special ordered them for your size and they would have them embroidered with your name and the date maybe I need to find my original one because it has my name on it and it may have the date that I earned my black belt. I don't remember what got what is embroidered into this belt, but it would have information on there. And so they had they had to special order that and get that in and then they would then you would have a belt ceremony. Maybe it was even a month after. I don't remember. Yeah. Lost, lost the time. Long, long time ago. But I could find images, um, I'm sure, if I were to look up. I do remember being absolutely drenched in sweat when I, uh, when I took the test. The physically demanding, multiple-hour-long test that re- was required. They gave me a few tips. I had sweatbands, which I'd never done before. I put those on my arm to just get the sweat out of my face because you were just sweating buckets. And they also were like... Take your shirt underneath. You've, you've got your uniform, the gi. Um, take your shirt that's underneath it and soak it in water and wring it out and then put it on. And that'll help keep you cool over time. And so I did that. And I think one of the times when they let us go to the bathroom and go get water, I think I may have done it again at that point. I'm pretty sure I went and I, I disrobed in the in the bathroom and sunk and just dunked my shirt in the coldest water that the the sink faucet would and then wrung it out and put it back on so I could try again to stay cool with this because you're talking I mean it's non-stop at any point they would just be like all right drop and do push-ups all right now go hit on the bag for a while all right run in place for a while and in between that stuff, you're having to answer questions. You're having to do specific forms and show techniques. You would have to do, there were two of us, so they would have that, have us practice together with these different things. And it non-stop, except for when they would take a break. You would actually appreciate the times that you would get to answer a question because you would not be physically moving. It was extremely demanding. But that was a goal that I set out to achieve. It was difficult. It was, up until that point, the most difficult thing that I'd ever done in my life. And it was... Not many people did it. It was definitely a point of pride. And then later on in life, it became one of those, like... If you brought it up in conversation, people would kind of treat you differently. The general public, if you were to mention that you had a black belt. We did a lot of tournaments, too. I remember doing that. I don't think I ever did that. It was as I was coming up. I don't remember doing one as a black belt. I think by that point I was done with it. But I remember doing sparring. I remember doing the forms. And I remember not placing very highly when we would go up against... Like I said, this was a self-defense martial arts system. This was meant to be more grounded and meant to be more... I mean, defensive, right? It's something like that. It's not as flashy. It's not. That's literally how Taekwondo and stuff like that works. It's very interesting to learn these other styles. It was something that I really want to do, and I still one day would like to, is actually enroll again into a different style and learn more, because I'm just interested in martial arts in general, the entire practice of it, the history of it, a lot of it. All of that is very interesting to me, um, especially since I started so young, and it would be really interesting to, I mean, both go back and learn the same system that I did over again now that it's been 10 years and I don't practice I I know some things but I don't practice regularly it would be interesting to learn that again it would be interesting to learn a totally different system and I know that that I I've looked up there are still some who are still alive unfortunately most of the instructors were older and I know several of them have passed but so I've looked up that some of the ones who I, who I knew are still teaching karate in different ways they've moved studios or they tried to start their own thing in whatever way, but that's their life. That's their profession. And they also have other jobs on the side because you can't always depend on that, depending on what it is. You either make it very commercialized and it kind of loses its purity, in in my opinion, and certainly the opinion. That's, that's one of the things that was talked about a lot, and that's probably where my opinion was shaped by just parroting what the other people would say. And there would be people who would be like, yeah, they would, they would hate on Taekwondo, being like, it's all flashy, it's not useful in a real fight, this kind of stuff. It's like, well, 
I don't agree or disagree because I don't know Taekwondo. I don't know that kind of stuff. I know that there was a lot of hate towards it. But I don't know if that was necessary. <laughs> anyway. It was certainly interesting. And yeah, the, the tournaments, I remember the first one. Uh, that tape is long gone, but they videotaped to me and my family. The first sparring tournament, I just froze entirely. They were like, all right, and go. And Michael didn't move. <laughs> Michael, Michael, and, and this is just, it's sparring. So you put on the pads and everything and you go up against someone else and you're just trying to hit them in certain areas that count for points. That's, that, that's point sparring. That's what you were doing. And Michael just stood there. Michael didn't throw a punch. Michael didn't throw a kick. <laughs> Michael did better at uh, the other tournaments that we did, but we wound up doing a couple of tournaments and then we started going out as a demo team, specifically where we would go do... Um, we would go show off forms and we would go show off, you know, sparring and things like that. We would kind of choreograph a fight in order to go perform in front of neighborhood schools uh, at public events. There was a car show one time in a church parking lot and we went and did a whole thing there for the crowd. Again, to kind of drum up business. Hey, look what these guys are doing. Is this cool to you? Come learn at this studio. Try to get people. The studio couldn't afford it and after a while it did close down and then went to working out of a a, a spare room that a church had. Um, and that was, that was when it really tailored off. And I realized I was like, I've been doing this for, I think at that point it had been five years nonstop and I was burnt out. So I, I dipped out at that point and, and then everything closed down after that. They basically managed to stay open long enough to like, they, they were committed to staying open at reduced rates because it was no longer in a studio and just, you know, once a week, something like that, to try to get everybody who was dedicated. They were no longer trying to operate as a business, and it was more of just a collective of the people trying to get those, th those ones who'd already dedicated several years and had not gotten to their black belt, trying to get those people to that point where they did the black belt. And I remember that specifically, because even though I dropped off and wasn't going as much, they did pull me in there as a black belt and my sister as well, who achieved her black belt. They had us come in for the black belt test to test those people. Um, the last the last group to go through. I, I remember doing that. And I remember being out of practice with it too because I remember getting stage fright by talking to the people. Uh, I, didn't, I, I wasn't great at teaching. <laughs> I, I was just barking. <laughs> I remember doing that and not going over well with stuff like that. That was in general. But the black belt test specifically, I was just out of practice and forgot some of the names of things. And so I'd be reading it out and questioning what I was reading if it was even right because not everything's in English, obviously. It's an ancient martial arts form from overseas. I think it was started by a man who went and learned like multiple different schools of martial arts and then made his own kind of combining everything together. Um, if I remember correctly, it's been a long time since I've looked up the history of that stuff. Hmm. So anyway, that was the earliest that I can remember that I set a goal was to get a black belt to become a black belt, whatever. There's a lot of terminology. It was a whole thing. And looking back at it, it's a little, a little odd just because some of it was very ritualistic and some of it was very forced maybe it was almost military in a way and i'm not a fan of that in the ways that it was but i also understand why it was again it was not just learn how to throw a punch learn how to kick it was discipline it was teaching how to become an adult and a lot of who i am was shaped by that <laughs> I am not in the habit of saying sir or ma'am anymore, that's for sure. But it does kick in every once in a while. I'll do that and they'll be like, whoa, <laughs> whoever I'm talking to at the time. So yeah, that was a goal that I set out to achieve. I had a, a realistic dream, way to do it. I had the methods and it was just on me to get there. And doing that set upon a path of trying to accomplish goals and finding out and that would only come back probably 10 years later when I started doing stuff like this. This is how, like, if you wanted to get your black belt, they told you, they said, you have to practice over and over and over the same forms, the same moves until you get it down. Perfect. Cause it's not certain schools, depending on where you went. And I wound up talking to a friend later on and they were like, well, for my black belt test, there was this, you know, there's the practice, show the forms. And then there was, do the, you know, do the physical stuff, go outside, run around, 
sprints up and down a hill or something like that. You know, they had very similar things. And then they went, and then the last thing is defend yourself against all the black belts who are attacking you full out. And I went, what do you mean full out? And they're like, no pads or anything, full out. I walked out of there bloody. And I went, what are you, you walked out of there bloody? What are you talking about? That we, no, that's insane. <laughs> that sounds, I would never be a part of a school like that because that's not useful to me. That doesn't seem... What do you learn from that? Do you learn how to get your butt kicked? Is that really something that's useful to you? You learn how to take a punch. You learn how to fight. That's one thing. How often that actually comes in play, I don't... I've rarely ever had to use anything like that. And I hope to never have to use anything like that. Any of the skills that I learned during that. And, and, you know, it's more of an exercise and stuff like that. But I just don't understand how getting jumped by 15 black belts in one go who are going all out and you walk out bloody after That sounds like they're not using the control. There's a difference. I understand going up against... And we had things like that with padding. You definitely would. And it was, you know... There was, there was one time, this was actually a fun, because again, it's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be discipline and learning and things like that, but it's not supposed to be out of control and you should never wind up getting seriously injured. Blood draw is kind of a serious injury. We would stop if something like that happened. I'm not saying it never did. We definitely had some accidents and people wound up getting stitches and things like that, but it was meant to be controlled. You were supposed to be controlled. You're not trying to hurt this other person. And I understand why that both could and could not help you in a real situation fight. But I also, in a real situation fight, most things are out the window. It's not really a one-to-one comparison. And I don't think that you can really ever train yourself for that, even if you go into it. Like, uh, there's still going to be some element of control. So, I don't know. It's a whole thing. But anyway, the fun thing that we did do, I remember we would do, you know, in sparring class, because that was different from your normal stuff, but everybody would have their pads and their gear and things like that. And usually you would just pair up and go and have points. And, you know, if, if there was somebody to watch, they would be the referee. But usually you just kind of do it yourself and go, yeah, you got tagged. Because it's a sport. It's meant to be between two friendly opponents. It should never go all out. And I got my butt kicked a lot by people who went all out. And they got in trouble for losing control and going all out, which is not the point of it. So anyway. <sighs> there was one thing that they would do where one person would get into the middle of a ring of people. You would have, I don't know, 10, 15 people in a ring. And you would do that. And then they would yell out names. The names of, as long as nobody had the first, you know, the same first name at work. They'd yell it out. So you would have to remember your position In a ring of people, you'd have to remember, oh, that person's over there and that person's over there. Try to remember where everybody is because as soon as they yelled out the name, they would come attack you and you would try to just do it. It was just a quick, you know, they'd come do one, maybe two moves and you would defend yourself and then they would back up and you'd get somebody else and they would just go and go and go. And it would get fun because towards the end, the black belt would name out like five people at the same time (laughs) or they would be doing that. And while they're walking around the outer edge, they could just tap someone and not say a name and you could get jumped from behind. Again, in a controlled environment where everyone's wearing pads, no one was hurting each other, just to kind of learn reflexes and things like that. That was a lot of fun. I would walk out of a... If I went and started training at a studio and they went, no, we are actually going to be throwing... We're not going to be pulling punches. We're not going to be, you know, there's no padding or anything. Uh, We're just going to attack you and you will defend yourself and you will walk out. You could break a bone. You could, you know become bloodied, something like that, I would leave that studio. That's not worth it to me. That's, it's just not, it's not a real fight as it is. It's already going to be uneven. And I, there's just no control there at that. No, I'm not, I'm not down for that. Not with what I learned after everything there. I, I, I see it. And there are people who probably don't know any better who just went through, I mean, the friend that I had was like, that's just how it was at the school. That's what you did. Like, well, I understand they want you to prove it to be a black belt and they want to put you through hell to do it, but I don't think so. I don't think so. I know. I started doing not quite sparring, drunken fighting with my friends. Whenever we would have a party, it'd be like, you want to go fight? And we would go fight, but it was still... It was still somewhat controlled. We were stupid by not having any padding or anything whatsoever, but there was pretty much control. Don't hit each other where it's going to hurt too bad. Try not to hit them in the face. Don't break anything. And still, one guy, I mean, we're older at this point, like I said, drunken. 
we would drink and then go fight. And one of, one of our friends, one of my good friends could just shut off pain. And that is really dangerous because I could not stop him. He wasn't that much physically bigger than me. We were probably around the same size and stuff. And, but, and like I had years of karate that I had no longer been practicing in any way, but he could just shut off pain. I gave him everything I had and kicked him in the stomach one time fully after he'd pinned me to the ground. And he just he shrugged it off like it was nothing. And I remember asking, I was like, did that not hurt? He's like, oh yeah, that hurt real bad. I'm going to have a ridiculous bruise on my stomach where you kicked me. Didn't matter in the moment. He just shut it off. I would not do that again. I learned my lesson there with that stuff because specifically there was one point. I don't think it was him. I think it was somebody else. But I, I was trying to get him into a headlock or something just to pin him to the ground because this, that was usually when it was over. You didn't stay on the ground much. It was more kind of wrestling. Um, or you did stay on the ground more than anything. Pretty much once you went down and somebody tapped out, I was like, all right, that's it. And so it was something like that. But I did that. And he slammed his head back and caught me in the chin which jammed my teeth up and I chipped one of my teeth. And that was the more permanent, like nothing else had ever happened. Nobody was bloodied. Nobody was hurt in any way. It was just like, ah, good fight, you know, sparring kind of thing. Again, incredibly stupid. Would never do it again. But yeah, that, that was the, that was the last one we ever did because that was when I called it quits when I was like, oh yeah, this could permanently hurt me. And I'm really upset by the fact that I just chipped my tooth and I'm, I can't stop rubbing my tongue on it. And then I made my tongue bleed. (laughs) That was the end of that. Anyway, that was something, I'm just going to keep bringing it back around to that point. That was something specifically that I set out to do. I set out to get my black belt. It was a very difficult road to get there. I almost didn't make it, but in the end I did dedicate myself to it and I got there. And that, it does ring true. If I ever have to think back to something that was, I didn't have a whole lot going on that was very difficult. I was, again, homeschooled, so you weren't, like, trying to pass grades or classes or anything. There wasn't a lot of failure in my life. It was just, oh, let's try to do better on this something. We didn't really have grades. We didn't have anything like that. So I did not have a normal childhood in that way. Black karate taught me a lot of the stuff that most people would have learned from going to a public school. Including fighting, apparently, from the horror stories I've heard about people who've been to public schools, things like that. Anyway, that was something that that I haven't I haven't thought about that in such detail in a while, but that came to mind as soon as I read the question of what was a goal because I obviously there have been plenty of goals as an adult. Um, I that's all I do now is set goals. I I'm tracking most everything I'm doing. That's what, like, the updates I was talking about earlier. Those are all things that I set out to, I, I, a goal to watch all of Star Wars, because I'd never done all of that before. It may not be as impressive as getting your black belt, as physically demanding, or all you have to do is make the time and sit and watch it. It's not exactly a challenge to myself, but it's still something that I want to do, because I set the goal for myself to do that. I want to watch all of Star Wars. I never watched all the animated shows, and I haven't watched most of them in years. And I really enjoy it, and it's a shame that I never made the time for it. This was a way to go, this is my goal, I'll make the time for it now, and I'll achieve that. And I'm working my way through them. I am not quite to the last season of Rebels. And I'm also watching Mandalorian, which just started this week and is excellent. And Bad Batch. Why did they make those come out on the same day? I don't have enough time to watch both to both shows in one night. I have to split it up. I've been watching Bad Batch weekly as it comes out. Anyway, obviously a larger goal that I would like to accomplish all of this stuff that I'm doing. Literally how my life is different for over the last few years since I started doing this. Going out into nature, trying to see wildlife, trying to get, you know, trying to observe their behavior and get it on camera. All of that. The, the eventual goal of being able to do this as a career or in just a way to support myself basically would be the eventual goal. Um, I've been doing it for more than two years now on video and more years before where I was just kind of messing around taking still photos and it, I have some incredible moments in my life and I have to set realistic goals because I can't just, I would love to just go by this time next year, I'll be doing this professionally. It's not going to happen. It's almost impossible. Not entirely, but it's incredibly difficult because that's, there's just not that kind of demand for people who go out into nature with a camera. There are very, very few jobs for people who do that. And I saw something earlier this week that was really interesting to me. Um, somebody said that, you know, the old saying about photographers, and I'd never heard this before, but they said, there are those who, 
what is it? I don't remember exactly, so I'm paraphrasing, but it's something about those who do it as a hobby who have a career to support that, and those who do it professionally who have a significant other who has a career to support them. <laughs> and that's more or less going to be the truth. <laughs> Uh, so I really need the public education system to up their teacher's pay so that my significant other can support both of us. That's not realistic at all. So the reality of it is I'm going to enjoy the time that I have. This is me living life to the fullest when I get to come out and do stuff like this. This is how, this is the meaning of life to me. And that's what I want to be doing. I, when I get to come out and do this, that's the best version of me. So I'll keep doing it in whatever capacity I can with whatever equipment I can afford at the time for probably the rest of my life. If, if I can find a way to get hired on by a professional company to have go, to go out and shoot stuff like that, that would be amazing. It's not likely to happen. I think a more likely scenario would be to, to find an audience who will support me like the people on Patreon. But I have to find enough of them to do that, and obviously catering to a more broad audience is not what I'm interested in doing, and that's kind of why I just do whatever I feel like doing. I don't try to... I'm not trying to make out to make a YouTube channel that will be successful. I'm just doing whatever I do, and anyone who enjoys what I'm doing and wants to support me, that would be great. If I find enough of those people, then I might be able to transition into doing this more regularly. That would be ideal. That seems to be more likely than me actually being able to find a dedicated job. Because a lot of people, from what I've looked at, who go and do that stuff, also have degrees in, like, you know, camera operating, cinematography, director of photography. That's a title. That's not a degree. Anyway, not a path I want to go down. I'd love to learn and do that stuff, but it's just not realistic for me to go attend a school. I've thought about it more than enough times. I know that it's possible to do it without so, and that's the path that I'm going to take. Because I don't want to do schooling and have to learn other things as well. But I could look for some more online classes. I could learn more stuff like that. I haven't done that in a minute, and I've been meaning to. Maybe I will. Anyway, that was a long time rambling. I did not mark to see when I started this. Hopefully all the footage got saved from there, and it's not just audio at the beginning of this, plus the GoPro, which... I assume it's still recording because it's still flashing red, but it no longer shows me. For conserving battery life, it cuts off the uh, the screen, so I can't actually see. I just get a little red indicator that flashes every once in a while to let me know it's still going. So hopefully all that came out. Anyway, that was the question for today. Setting goals, accomplishing them. That was a goal that I set out to do, and I really need to look into... As a matter of fact, while I'm just sitting here doing this, I'm going to wrap it up, but I'm going to message a sibling. Hey, when is the next time you will be at Dad's? I would like to know if there is still my stuff there, especially my embroidered... Black belt, belt, and diploma. Pretty sure that would have been in a box I left behind when I moved and didn't have space. There we go. Now it's happened. Now you know. And to my sibling who was just watching that. Now you know when I did this, if you just got that message. All right, that's it. Fun time out, good time today. I don't know why I'm wrapping this up like I do the wildlife stuff where I talk about what I've just been through. Um, I'm gonna go do personal things with myself. That's not how, I'm going to go eat. I was just trying to think of the personal vlog. That was phrased very poorly. I have to end this now. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.